Wiggle your fingers, wiggle your toes, bend your knees and your elbows, and look and see if everybody is doing it too, just like you. Stop popping up and down with your arms to the side and wrap them up and down like a butterfly and look and see if everybody is doing it too just like you and if we all do the same we'll all be together moving around as one and if we all do it now we'll all be together having a whole lot of fun just like yeah. Hello everyone! Hello and welcome to the Grand Children's Literature Festival 2020 at home. We have got a fantastic programme lined up for you and today we have our very first event. He is the author of over 100 children's books, including one of my childhood favourites, the 100 miles an hour dog. He's the king of comedy. He's coming to us all the way from Turkey. And we're gonna have a live Q&A afterwards, so do keep sending in your questions. We need you to cheer and shout. We're gonna pretend we can hear you. We could use the ship extra loud because he's all the way in Turkey. It's Jeremy Strong. Hello, hello everybody. I'm really, really, really pleased to be with you like this. What an extraordinary thing, isn't it? Here I am in Turkey, and we're, I don't know how many thousands of miles apart, but, but we can talk to each other, and I hope you can see me clearly, and I hope you're going to enjoy yourselves. It, it's great to be with you. First of all, I'm going to say hello in Turkish to you. We say uh, merhaba. Though some of you in the audience might actually be Turkish, so a special merhaba to you and nazasin ben iyim. That means uh, how are you? I'm well, well and all, all those sorts of things that we greet each other when, when we when we greet each other in whatever country. Anyhow, um, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna start by telling you a little bit about where I am. You can probably see behind me there are these lovely lovely hills behind me. And just over, uh, just over here uh, is the sea. Unfortunately, at the moment, it's exactly the same color as the sky. So you can't tell the two apart. In fact, if you are very sharp-eyed, while I'm talking to you, you might even see a boat go drifting past. And if you do, it, you might think it's an airplane because, like I said, you can't tell whether it's sea or sky behind us, but it, 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 it's, a, it's a bit of both. And another thing I want to point out to you is this little path I think I'm pointing at it more just over there it is that you see that part that path winding winding around the hill there uh, that that track runs in front of our house but if we go and walk up there to that to that little corner you can see the whole of the Mediterranean spread out before you lots of little islands and and boats and it's very very beautiful and you can also find um, uh, different animals up there. If you if you're quiet and you go up there early in the morning, you can see deer, and we found porcupine quills up there, and there are wild boar and wild goats. And um, just a few days ago, we found a land crab. What it was doing up there, I don't know. I know they live on the. I know you you know land crabs obviously live on land but they do go down to the sea as well and if a land crab was up there it would take at least two months to walk down to the sea from where it was up there and what else did we see oh we were when we were having lunch yesterday there were three eagles flying overhead they were circling around our heads really high up in the sky so um we're very lucky to be here we're in lockdown of course like uh like um, most of you uh, we're not allowed yet, especially if you are over 65. And it might surprise you to know that I'm several years over 65, and I know you all thought I'm only about 20, didn't you? Yes, of course you did, until you saw me. 
And then your heart sank and you thought, uh, he's about 450. No, I'm not really. Anyway, um, talking of, of, of how, how we look, I don't know about you, but I never, I, I never really liked seeing myself in, in, in photographs because um, you never look how you feel. I mean, inside, you know, you, you think inside yourself, you think, oh, I'm so handsome, I'm so wonderful, I'm so young. And then you see a photograph of yourself and you think, ah, oh, no, I'm not really, am I? So um, photographs, unfortunately, tell you the truth about yourself, don't they? And um, I've got a lovely portrait of myself, actually, which I'm very, very fond of. And I'd, and I'd like to share that with you in, in a moment. Uh, and it is uh, a photograph. Um, well, it's not a photograph, actually, it's a picture. I went to a school, I was visiting a school and talking to the children at the school about writing and all those sorts of things. And when I arrived, I was very surprised. All the children were in assembly and they asked me to go in. And when I went into assembly, all the children were holding up drawings of what they thought I looked like. Now, they'd never seen me before, okay? So they'd done these drawings, and some of them were paintings, some were coloured in, and so on. And they were great. There were lot, all these different pictures that the children were holding up. And one of those paintings was so brilliant. I, I was absolutely captivated by it. And I said to the boy who painted it, look, I really, really like your painting. Um, would you be willing to swap it with me? If I give you one of my books and sign it for you, would you give me your painting? And he agreed to that, and he signed his painting, and he gave that to me. I signed my book, and I gave that to him. And uh, that painting hangs in the room where I work when I'm in England. And it's one of my favorite paintings. Um, and I, I'm going to show it to you now. Now, I hope that this is all working. Um, I don't know if we can uh have confirmation of that has that picture come up haven't seen it just yet jeremy has that picture come up i can't see it yet you can't see it okay um right just a moment then uh I'm already sh I'm already sharing, so I don't know what I don't know what's happened. Maybe we'll have to work around this and not have the slideshow in that case. Um, have um, apologies for the delay, Richard. Have have you got the slideshow there? Can can you do it from your end at all? Ah. I can see a small, uh, that's the first one. Have you got the second picture? I can see it now. Woo! Aha, there we go. That is fantastic. Yeah, that's great. Okay, can, can, we, can we keep things like that? Um, sure, I, Jeremy. Okay, so if I, if I ask for the next, when I ask for the next picture, can you control it from your end? Absolutely. Brilliant. Thank you. Okay, let's carry on. So there we are. That, believe it or not, is a portrait of me. And as you can see, it doesn't look like me at all. But what I love about it is that it is so full of joy and uh, comedy and humor and laughter. And if ever I feel a bit miserable at all or fed up, all I have to do is look at that picture and it cheers me up. It's as if that crazy smile comes zooming out of the painting and smacks itself across my own face and I end up going, <laughs> anyway, there we are. It's nice to get those sorts of things. And, and um, you know, sometimes children send me things, which is, which is very nice, and they tend to arrive in the post. And I get some quite interesting things sometimes. Like, um, not so long ago, I, I, I got this. Can we have the, the next picture, please? This, this uh, parcel arrived in the post, and there it is, a flying cow. Now, some of you may have read a book of mine called Crazy Cow Saves the World. Well, almost. And when I finished writing that story, I sent it to a young friend of mine, Hal. And Hal was so pleased with it. 
he sent me this flying cow by way of saying thank you. And if you look carefully, you can see it's hanging on a string over my desk. And when you switch it on, it flaps its wings and it starts going round and round and round in, in, in circles. And it's almost impossible to catch. In fact, if you want it to stop, you, you either have to wait till the batteries run out or you, or you could just shoot it, I suppose. Oh, I think I've got an even better idea. What, what you could do is you could open the window and then snip through the string and you, then you could watch as the crazy cow, as a flapping cow goes flying off into the, out of the window to freedom. I'm free. Moo. So that's the flying cow. And, and then not so long ago, uh, I got this small packet in the post and, and it was just before Christmas and I was looking at it and um thinking oh somebody sent me an early christmas present i wonder what it could be now i don't know if you um if well i don't know how well behaved you are but when i was a child um i did some i did a few naughty things every now and then and one of the things i used to do when Christmas came around, I'd be hunting around under the Christmas tree for the presents that had my name on. And then when I got, found them, I'd pick them up and I'd give them a good shake to see if they rattled or I'd uh, pull a little bit of piece of paper off and look inside or I'd feel it all over and try to work out what it was. So that's what I was doing with this little packet that had arrived, okay? I was feeling it all over. And it was lumpy, and I was pretty sure it's a bar of chocolate. So I thought, well, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to wait till Christmas. I like chocolate, so I'm going to eat it right now. So I opened it up, and this is what it was. Here's the next picture. It was a carrot, a carrot wearing a skirt. And as you can see, it's a carrot that has grown two legs. And um, when it arrived, it also had not just a skirt, it, it also had a paper face stuck on the top a smiley paper face, so it looked like a person. Now, I've got a pretty strong idea that uh, a lot of you have read some of the, my brother's famous bottom stories. Yeah. One of those stories is called My Brother's Famous Bottom Goes Camping. And in that story, there is uh, a little girl who has found a carrot, which has uh, grown legs, just like this one in the picture. And... She thinks it looks like, like a person. So she makes it into a doll. She puts a skirt in it. She draws a smiley face on paper. She sticks that on the top of the carrot, and she calls her carrot doll Cecily Sprout. She takes it with her wherever she goes. But when the whole family go on holiday, Cecily Sprout goes too. The carrot doll gets lost. That is the end of Cecily Sprout until just before last Christmas. This packet arrived. I opened it up. Out fell Cecily Sprout along with a letter from a girl called Chiara, who wrote to me to say, Dear Jeremy, we have found Cecily Sprout. She's not lost at all. She was hiding in a bag of Sainsbury's carrots. Oh, I'll start again. She was hiding in a bag of Sainsbury's carrots. So uh, anyway, they decided, her little brother decided to make the skirt and they, they made her into Cecily Sprout and they sent her by post all the way over to me. I was rather surprised to receive that, I must say. But it's nice to get those sorts of things. Now then, let's talk about stories for a moment. I'm going to be reading to you a little bit of a story soon. But before that, I want to tell you um, a little bit about writing. I bet some of you like writing stories. I wish I could see you, because if I said to you, um, put your hands up, uh, if, if you write stories, then I'd be able to see how many of you actually like writing stories. And um, I, write a, I write at home, of course. And I, I've always enjoyed writing stories, ever since I was about five or six. And I began by writing down stories um, that I knew. And one of those stories was called Jason and the Argonauts. Now, Jason and the Argonauts is actually a very famous story. And in fact, funnily enough, um, it's about a man who, who sailed his boat around the Mediterranean Sea. And that, of course, is the Mediterranean Sea behind me. So if I was here about 3,000 years ago, I might have seen Jason go sailing past, except, of course, that he was mythological. He was 
a mythical hero. He didn't really live. He wasn't a real person. But Jason and his crew of sailors went sailing around the Mediterranean. They had all these fantastic adventures. They had to fight three-headed fire-breathing monsters, battle against uh, skeleton armies. He had to uh, that, sail through the most terrifying storms where giant rocks would be crashing together just as he tried to sail his boat between them. He had a tough time. And I thought his story was so exciting, I wanted to write it down for myself. So I did. I was just over six years old. And it just so happens that my mother kept that story. I still have it. And here it is. Take a look at this. It's coming up any moment. Almost there. There we go. Now, I hope you can read it. Uh, uh, I, can, I can just about read it. And if you start reading it, you may have noticed one or two spelling mistakes. In fact, there are over 15 spelling mistakes by the time you get halfway down that page. Halfway down and there are more than 15 spelling mistakes. So an awful lot of spelling mistakes. Here's something else you might have noticed. There are no capital letters. There are no full stops. What was I thinking? Well, I was only just over six years old and I was writing it at home. And um, so you can see <coughs> there are a lot of things wrong with that story. Now, I bet some of you forget to put your capital letters in sometimes. I bet some of you miss out the odd full stop. I bet some of you make spelling mistakes. And in fact, I bet your mums and dads still make spelling mistakes because grown-ups make spelling mistakes too. It's not just you. We all make spelling mistakes. It's just that when we're young, we make a lot more than when we're older. As we get older, we get better at it. And I don't mean we get better at making spelling mistakes. We get better at not making spelling mistakes. So I just wanted you to, wanted you to see that because I know that sometimes, you know, when, when you write things, um, People say, somebody might say to you, oh, you spelled all that bit wrong and that bit wrong. But you see, when you're writing a story, the most important thing is the story. It's the story that's important. And I know some grown-ups who still make lots of spelling mistakes. Or some of the, I know I have lots of friends who are dyslexic and, and things like that. But they are brilliant writers. Even so, no matter what, they are still brilliant writers. Okay, so I did that when I was about six years old. Just one more thing about that picture. Take a look at Jason. My goodness me. He's a chunky chap, isn't he? Have you noticed on the very first line of writing there, it says, there once lived a block. I meant to put bloke, of course, but I left the E off because I didn't know how to spell it and it's come out as block. And, he, and I think, actually, Jason looks like a block there, doesn't he? He looks more like a block than a bloke in that picture. I think he's been built out of blocks. Anyway, let's move on. So, I don't know about you when you like to write stories, but I, I suspect that most of you like to go somewhere quiet when you're writing. You don't want to be disturbed by people. And certainly that, that's my case. I have to go somewhere quiet. And in the next picture, you can see where I go. Here it is just coming up. Here's the shed at the bottom of my garden. Not the garden I'm in now, of course, because we're in Turkey. When I'm in Turkey, most of the time I, I might write outside or I might write um, on one of the terraces or something like that. But uh, when I'm in England, I go to this shed. And as you can see, it's a, a rather nice shed. And if you go through those glass doors, you'll find yourself in quite a big space. There's enough room in there for a desk, which is as big as uh, your bed at home. In other words, it's an enormous desk and I've got um, uh, bookshelves and books and uh, all the things that I need for writing and pictures on the walls and so on. And uh, if you look very carefully through those glass doors, you can probably see a white rectangle there. And that's my fridge. Fridges are very important, you know. There's something, I'm going to let you in on a writer's secret. Okay. Here it is. If you want to write a story, it's a really good idea to have a fridge nearby. Yeah. So there's something you can do about this. When you go back to school and your teachers say to you, we're going to write stories now. Come on. 
you must put up your hand and you say, excuse me, where's the fridge? And your teacher will probably go, he probably won't understand. And he'll probably go, uh, what do you mean, where's the fridge? And that's when you say, oh, well, we need fridges to write stories. And your teacher will say, where do you get that crackpot idea from? And that's when you come up with your killer answer. And all you have to do is say, Jeremy Strong told us, he's a writer. He's got a fridge. We want fridges. Yay! And I'm sure the teacher will say, okay, there'll be fridges in every classroom tomorrow. Or not. What do you think? Probably not really. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm just joking, really. But uh, but it, I, I do have a fridge there. You saw it. I do have a fridge there because, of course, I don't want to have to walk all the way back to the house to go and get something to eat or drink or whatever. So I just keep fresh fruit in there and chocolate. Fresh fruit, chocolate, chocolate and fresh fruit, especially the chocolate. So that's the, that's the uh, shed. Now then, I've been writing some news stories and, uh, in that shed, and they are about a pair of characters called Armadillo and Hare. And here is a picture of the first book just coming up to show you. In fact, I've got it in my hand here too, Armadillo and Hare. And uh, that, those stories I wrote uh, two or three years ago now, and um, they've been doing very nicely. And I'm very fond of Armadillo and Hare. And I was asked to write a second book about Armadillo and Hare, which I've got with me here, and it's coming up on screen as well. I hope the writing's around the right way. I'm not sure it looks around the wrong way here. There you go. And I'm going to read you now from one of the stories from Armadillo and Hare and the Very Noisy Bear. Could we have the first picture from the, from the book, please? There's Armadillo. He looks a bit as if he's in pain, doesn't he? And it's hardly surprising. I'm going to tell you what happens. Armadillo thought it was the most awful racket he had ever heard. The most tremendous bashing and crashing had been going on for 15 minutes. He found one of Hare's much-loved scarves and wound it round his ears. It didn't make much difference. He went out onto the porch. The noise was even louder. But the grassy meadow in front of the little log cabin was empty. What on earth is it? He growled. Where is it coming from? Hare was fascinated. His long ears were leaning towards the noise as if strong magnets were at work. I think it sounds quite exciting, said Hare. His eyes big and round, staring towards the deafening, invisible clamour. Armadillo turned his head sharply towards his friend. Exciting, he repeated. Exciting? It sounds as if the world is coming to an end. Hare gave Armadillo a challenging look. It's called music, he declared. It's called noise, and I don't like it. If you think that's music, maybe you should go and see where it's coming from and ask them to turn it down. It's giving me toothache. Well, I didn't ask. If, if you, sorry. If you ask me, it's all those sweet biscuits you like eating with your cheese that's giving you toothache, Hare told his friend. Well, I didn't ask you, did I? Armadillo answered. I suppose we shall have to go and find out just what is making that cacophony. You'd better give me my scarf back if we're going out. Stick your paws in your ears instead. Hare smiled to himself. Silly old armadillo. Hare soon discovered that he wasn't the only one excited by all the throbbing, bashing and crashing that was going on. There was a sudden pinging and parping as Wombat came cycling past. She was riding no hands because she was high, trying to hold down a baseball cap on her head, as well as operating her bicycle bell and horn. The cap was several sizes too big and kept flopping about. Nevertheless, it did rather suit Wombat. Hare thought so too. With a hat like that and one of his famous scarves, he would look really smart indeed. 
I found it on the branch of a tree, Wombat explained, breathless from peddling. I suppose it must belong to someone. In the meantime, I'm looking after it. Are you going to find out what that noise is? Hare nodded and laughed. Armadillo here thinks it's the end of the world. Well, it is quite loud, Wombat agreed. Look, there's Tortoise up ahead. Tortoise was not the only one up ahead of them. Soon they spotted Giraffe, G Jaguar and Elephant. By this time the noise was so loud it made Hare's insides wobble. They went round a large bush and there in front of them was the noise. Next picture please. Here it is, the noise. Hare's eyes almost popped out from his head. Wombat had to do a cartwheel and a handspring. Tortoise stood on tiptoe to see better and exclaimed, Oh my! Oh my! several times over. In front of them was an animal that the big forest had never seen before. A very large, round and fabulously white bear wearing sunglasses was smashing away on a massive set of drums and cymbals. Giraffe! who rather fancied himself as a dancer, had already begun to sway in time to Bear's furious rhythm. Now Hare's ears began to sway and jerk too. Even Tortoise could not stop his head from bobbing from one side to the other. Mouse was trying, with great difficulty, to do a waltz inside Armadillo's cardigan pocket. Jaguar stepped out of the big forest and joined the growing audience. She sat down, licked a paw, and smoothed back one ear. What is this? she asked Armadillo with a puzzled sigh. Don't ask me, grunted Armadillo. Hare says it's music. I say it's noise. Hmm, Jaguar nodded slowly. I'm inclined to agree. I like melodies. No, no, interrupted Tortoise, still bobbing his head. This is beat, beat, beat music. Maybe, but there's no need to beat, beat, beat one over the head with it. Armadillo shot back. I'm going to stop the story there for a moment. We'll come back a little bit later to finish it off. I hope you're enjoying it. I love writing these stories about Armadillo and Hare. Now then, uh, back to the shed. Next, next picture, sh uh, please. I'm going to show you what what's in inside the shed. If we if we go in through those glass doors, uh, then we can see. Um, well, we can see all sorts of things. First of all, you can see my cat, Jeeves. He likes looking after my writing paper. You see that big white box there? That's got my best writing paper in it, and you've probably already noticed that it's also got my best cat in it. He likes writing stories too. He comes and he stands on my laptop and then he starts paddling about with his paws on my laptop. So I'll be writing a story and it might be something like, you know, it was a dark and creepy night and all at once there was, a, and then Jeeves goes and stands there and the story goes, thank you, Jeeves. Then he'll move his paws and it'll go, his stories are absolutely useless. If he ever gets one of his stories published, it would have to be called, I don't know, Jesus' Big Book of Rubbish, something like that. Anyway, he'll go away, then I can get on with my story. So there's, there's Jeeves, uh, and it's, it's nice to have a little bit of company. He stays with me while I'm writing, and he, he, doesn't, um, you know, he, he doesn't wander around too much. He generally just goes to sleep, so that's nice. Okay, next picture, please. And now you can see my desk and you can see how big it is, and you will see underneath that lamp, you can see two big books. The one on top is a dictionary, in case I need to check my spellings. And underneath that is a thesaurus, and if you are in year three or above, you will know what a thesaurus is, a very, very useful dictionary. If you don't know what a thesaurus is, then you and you like writing stories, then you really should get yourself one, because it helps you find words that mean the same thing. For example, um, I'm just trying to think of an example now. Um, if you wanted to say something was beautiful, but you've already used the word beautiful, so you don't want to repeat it, 
you and you're thinking, oh, what other word can I use instead? Oh, I can't think of any other words for beautiful. You can look up beautiful in a thesaurus and it will tell you all the other words that mean beautiful, like gorgeous, wonderful, scintillating, etc., and uh, and so on. Lovely. Okay, so there's the dictionary of the thesaurus. And you can also see all those bits of paper spread about. They are not a story. Those are just the notes and the ideas for the story I was writing. In fact, I was writing the very first My Brother's Famous Bottom uh, book when I took that photograph. So those are the notes and ideas for that story. Because um, I, I like to, I, I think about the story uh, a lot be before I actually write. Now then, um, where were we? Oh yes, so you can also see my uh, laptop there, and keyboard and printer and so on. And Jesus is asleep on the armchair, look, do you see that? Fast asleep on the armchair. Actually, uh, he was, um, when I took that photograph, he was fast asleep, but the flash on the camera went off and it woke him up and he, he's actually looking back at me with, a, with one eye. And he's going, Oi, do you mind? I was fast asleep and you woke me up. So he's a bit annoyed. Anyway, um, if you look behind the... Uh, the chair there, you can just about make out uh, my my typing chair, which is very useful, my typing chair, because it's on wheels, you see. Now, this is where a typing chair on wheels and a fridge are very useful, because when I get hungry, I don't even have to get up from my typing chair. I just give a little kick, and my chair, with me on it, goes sliding across to the fridge. And I open the fridge door, and I look inside, and I think, oh, fruit. That looks nice. Chocolate. That looks nice. Which shall I have? Difficult choice. Chocolate. And then about an hour later, I get hungry again. So I go sliding back to the fridge and I open the door and I look inside and I think, well, you know, I had chocolate last time. So this time I'm going to have more chocolate. Yeah. Well, chocolate's very nice, isn't it? Okay, so that's my, my useful typing chair. And that's where I go to work. And I spend hours and hours down there, mostly thinking and making notes. Um, I probably think about a story for maybe uh, a couple of months, maybe even more, uh, slowly building up notes for the story b before, I, before I actually write it. I used to write my stories straight off. But uh, I don't, I don't do that anymore, um, because I found that I used to get stuck, and then I couldn't think of what to put next, and I start feeling miserable about it and get fed up. So now I, I think about the writing a lot um, b before I actually write the story. Okay, so what's next? Um, I think we will go back to. Uh, We've got, um, oh yes, the, the two books there. Um, the yellow one, that's the first, that is the first book about armadillo and hair. That's available in paperback, which you can buy from your local bookshop. And the, the one with the red cover, armadillo and hair, and the very noisy bear is a new one. That's, in, that's still in hardback. It'll be in paperback next year. But of course, you can also order that one. Jeremy, we've just put a link at the bottom of the screen if people would like to follow that and they can buy your book there. Okay, thank you. There's a link at the bottom of the screen. Uh, and if you follow that, you can buy buy the book there. So there you go. And uh, I guess you can probably use that link to, to buy uh, other books too. So anyhow, um, uh, before I read you the, the, the little... The, a bit more of the story. I just want to tell you one bit about how it came to be written because when I was creating the character of Hare, I wanted him to do something that was rather special, uh, 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 a little bit different and unexpected because it's always a good idea when you're writing a story to put unexpected things, little surprises into the story because it's those sorts of details that make the story interesting and keep the reader interested. Because when you're writing a story, you obviously, you want people to enjoy reading it. You don't want them to start reading and think, oh, this is boring, and go away and read something else. You want them to read your story. 
And I was trying to think of something that special that hair could do. And um, and then uh, I got this, I, I suddenly remembered something. And I thought, I know, he could play the tuba. Could we have the next picture, please? So here's a picture of a hair playing the tuba. And as you can see, as he plays the tuba, all sorts of things come flying out of the tuba. But they, they tend to float through the air quite slowly and then gradually they vanish away until they are no more. So all those things come bursting out of the tuba and then slowly disappear. And depending on what kind of music uh, Hare plays and what kind of mood he's in, different things come out. But unfortunately, for some reason, there's nearly always a toilet roll involved. I don't know why. You know, he might be thinking lovely thoughts. He might be thinking about a party. Maybe there's a party with balloons and, and little fireworks and candles and cake and great food. And, oh, and all those things will be coming out of the tuba. And, oh, there's a toilet roll. What's that doing there? Anyway, the idea for that, that thing about... Um, about hair playing the tuba came from something I remembered because uh, a few months before I wrote that story, that first story with hair playing the tuba, a few months before my wife Gilly and I had gone to London and we'd gone to visit some art galleries because we like looking at paintings and, and sculptures and things like that. And we were visiting one of the biggest art galleries in London, the, the National Gallery. It's got some great paintings in it. And when we came out, we were walking across the, the front of the National Gallery, which is at the side of Trafalgar Square. We were walking past, and we saw this. Take a look. There was this man sitting on an old-fashioned kind of radio, wearing a long black uh, coat and a black a uh, bit like a top hat, his black top hat. And he was playing the tuba. And every time he blew into it, flames came out of the top. As you can see from the photograph. It's one of my favorite photographs. And so when I came to think about hair and something special he could do, I thought he could be playing the tuba. But there won't be flames coming out of it. There will be all these other things that then slowly float away and vanish. People often ask writers, you know, where the ideas for stories come from. And that's where they come from. They come from things like that photograph. They come from memories. They come from things people tell you, things you might overhear on a bus or a train. Uh, they, they come from uh, thing. they often come from things that you see. For example, um, the tuba with the flames coming out of it. Or a few years back, uh, we were on holiday in France with our, our children and we were driving along and we passed a house that was falling to pieces. The roof was all broken. It was beginning to crash down into the center of the house. There were no windows. Uh, bricks were falling out of the walls. In fact, it was so uh, derelict. It was falling apart so much that on the front door, somebody had painted a big black skull and crossbones as a warning sign to say, danger, keep out. This house is falling to bits. You mustn't come inside. But my wife saw this house before I did. I was busy watching the road because I was driving. And um, my wife looked, saw the door with the skull and crossbones on it. And she turned to our children in the back of the car and said, oh, look, look, look at that house over there, skull and crossbones on the front door. Do you think... Um, do you think pirates live there? And I was driving along and I thought, doing, 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 doing. idea for a story. Pirates who live in a house. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized it was going to be a great idea. And eventually when we came back to England, I went down to the shed and I started work on it. And I wrote a book. Well, actually, I ended up writing two books about the indoor pirates because, of course, they stay indoors. They don't like going out. They don't like to go from their house. They don't like, they hate the sea. They hate the sea. One of them gets seasick. That's why he hates the sea. And, that, uh, and, and um, 
there's uh, there's another one who, who, who sim quite simply doesn't like getting wet, so he hardly ever baths either. And uh, another one like just likes to be at home with his teddy. He's called Bald Ben. He's got a tattoo on top of his bald head with a picture of a, a, a tattoo of a rose, and underneath it says, I love mum. And he's always carrying his teddy around with him, which he likes. Imagine that, a pirate with a teddy bear. Anyway, um, that was, that was uh, you know, just to give you an example of where the ideas of stories can, can come from. So, air plays his tube sometimes, and now I'm going to read you, we're going to finish off that story. If you remember, Armadillo has just snapped back at, uh, at Tortoise. There's no need to beat, beat, beat one over the head with it. Jaguar gave a snort of laughter. Um, can we have the next picture? Where are we now? All right, I'll come to that in a moment. I'll explain that one in a moment. We don't really need it, but it doesn't matter. Um, oh, sorry. I've started reading the story too soon. This is my mistake. I've got to, I'm going to explain this picture to you now, and then we'll go back to the story. I'm sorry about that. I've never done this before on the, on the, you know, talking to an audience like this. So there was bound to be at least one mistake that I've made. If you can spot the others, don't tell me. Okay. Uh, so, um, why did I, I wanted to talk to you about why I decided to write about some animals instead of people. Because up until I wrote Armadillo and Hare, nearly all my stories had been uh, about people. And I've always wanted to write about animals as well, because I loved reading about animals when I was a child. And what you're looking at now is one of the pictures from my very first favorite book. And all your life, people will, you know, people will be saying to you things like, "What? What's your favourite book?" And now I've got, I don't know how many favourite books because I've read so many, and I've got lots of favourite books. But this was my very first one, and I had this book when I was about five or so, and it was called Winky the Squirrel. And this is Winky here. He's a young, he's a young squirrel. He's blown out of his tree in a gale, and he's knocked unconscious. And the tree was in somebody's garden. And the children from the house go out in the garden after the, after the big gale and they find this unconscious squirrel and they bring it indoors and they look after it and, and they feed it. And, and so it becomes a little bit like a pet squirrel, although he still goes back to his tree eventually and, and he lives in the wild. But he likes to see the children. And when the children go out to see him, they give him biscuits, a digestive biscuit, just like this one here. And what Winky is doing there, and it says this in the story, he's, he's nibbling it, and it says how he liked to nibble around the edge, and he'd turn the biscuit while he was nibbling it. So the biscuit would get gradually get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until there was none left. And that was my favorite picture in, in my favorite book. And um, when my parents gave me a biscuit to eat, I would pretend to be Winky the Squirrel. It wouldn't matter if the biscuit was round or square or triangular, rectangular, whatever, it really didn't matter. I would get that biscuit and I would be Winky the Squirrel. I would nibble all the way around the edges. And as I was nibbling it, I would turn it just like Winky. It used to drive my parents mad, really did. My dad would look at me and say, will you stop playing with your food? And I'd say, but dad, I'm being Winky the Squirrel. And my dad would say, you can't be Winky the Squirrel anymore. You're 17. Stop it. I still do it sometimes. I'm 70 now. I don't care. I like Winky. So there. Okay. So that was, that was my first favorite book. And then... Um, Animal stories, I, I, like I said, I, I loved reading animal stories. And uh, in the next, in this picture you're looking at now, you can see my next, one of my next most favorite stories. Oh, boy, did I love this story. It's by uh, Gerald Durrell, who is a great animal conservationist. 
And this was a book he wrote about his family. And of course, it's been on television. Some of you might have seen some of the episodes on television. My family and other animals. And it was about his childhood. And I adored that book. It was really wonderful. And so I wanted to, I wanted to write about animals myself. And in fact, the very first stories I tried to get published were about animals, but they never did get published. Um, actually, that's not quite true. One of them did. Oh, we've got a visitor down here. Hello. He's just come to say hello, haven't you? This is Splodge. That's what we call him. He's actually a wild cat. You wouldn't believe it, would you? He, he's a wild cat who, who lives near the house, and we feed him from time to time, so he often comes to say hello. Anyway, um, enough disruptions from, from the cat. Okay, so I'm going to read you, uh, the, I'm going to finish off reading this story now um, about Armadillo and Hare and the very noisy bear. So you can see the next picture. We'll get to that in a moment. Back to where Jaguar was snorting with laughter. But Tortoise was annoyed. Just because you don't like it doesn't mean it's bad music. Others might like it. And they're welcome to it, muttered Armadillo. Would anyone like to dance with me? Asked Giraffe loftily, swooping his head amongst the audience. Me, yelled Lobster, launching herself at one of Giraffe's four ankles and clinging on. Giraffe beamed with pleasure and resumed his dance. Tortoise poked Wombat with one foot. Do you mind if I stand on your shoulders to get a better view? Not at all, Wombat beamed. But no sooner had Tortoise struggled up Wombat's back than he fell off. He toppled backwards and landed upside down with a breath-snatching crash on the grass. The music, or rather the noise, stopped at once. Beer, a bear peered anxiously over his drum set. As soon as he saw Tortoise upside down, he realized that this was an emergency. He grabbed a small white box with a red cross on it and hurried across to the accident. Oh, you can see him there with his white um, accident box, first aid box. Make way! Stand back, everyone! I'm coming through! Don't worry, I'm almost a doctor! Make way! The animals fell back as Bear crouched over Tortoise, who was feebly waving his legs in the air. And I think we've got a picture coming up. Now, where does it hurt? demanded Bear. Are you bruised? Anything broken? I can't see any bleeding. That's good. Can you breathe? Can you speak? Show me your eyes. Can you do this? And Bear went cross-eyed for a few seconds. Tortoise did the same. Oh, that's excellent, declared Bear. That means you're alive. Keep breathing. That helps even more. Now then, I'm going to bandage you. Tortoise finally managed to get his breath back. I, I, I don't need bandages, he told Bear. I just need to be turned over. Bear shook his head. No, 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 no. Patients always need bandages. That's what bandages are for. Keep still. Soon, Tortoise was muffled with bandages all the way up to his head. There, said Bear. You'll be all right now. But I'm still upside down, Tortoise told him. <laughs> a small point, Bear answered, a little crossly, and he turned him over. Can we have the, the next picture? I can't move my legs. Are they broken? asked Bear, sounding almost hopeful. No, they're tied up with bandages. But Bear had already turned his attention to the other animals and was introducing himself. Hello, everyone. I'm Bear of the polar variety. I'm almost a doctor. I have come to live in the big forest. Any aches or pains, coughs or whatnots, come and see me. I also play the drums. In fact, I'm a band. I call myself The Noise. How appropriate, Armadillo couldn't help saying. You are brilliant, cried Wombat, wildly waving her paws as if she was drumming. Bear was suitably chuffed. Thank you, Wombat. I see you found my cap. The wind blew it off, and you found it. Thank you. I did wonder where it came from, said Wombat, handing over the cap. 
but she couldn't hide her disappointment. She really did like it. Bear frowned. He shook his big head. You know, I think it's too small for me, really. Why don't you keep it? I've got another one somewhere. Can I? Can I? Really, 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 really? Thank you. I loved your music, Wombat gushed. But Jaguar disagreed. Hmm. I prefer music, she said, stroking her pearl necklace, with tunes. Bear shook his big head. Oh, I don't do tunes. I'm post-tune. I'm avant-garde. I have no idea what you mean, said Jaguar, shaking her head. I don't like long words. It means, began Armadillo, that he's noisy. All that bashing about. I stopped doing that when I was three. Hair sighed. That's where you went wrong, he told his friend. You should never have stopped. It's fun, exciting. Yes, it's so exciting. I'm going home, muttered Armadillo. And he did. Hare trailed after him. One by one, the other animals left and a calm silence descended along the edge of the big forest. Bear and Wombat were the last to go. A little cough got their attention. <coughs> Do you think you could... Untie my legs now? asked Tortoise politely. So, there you are. That's one of the stories from Armadillo and Hare and the Very Noisy Bear. And I hope you enjoyed it. There are, I think, uh, eight or nine stories in, in that book. Now then, <clears throat> we've got about 10 minutes left. And I think it's about time you started asking me some questions. And I think there are some questions ready. Ooh. And am I going to hear them or do I read them? I can I can read them for you, Jeremy. I think the top okay, voted no. question, the top voted question is, do you have a dog? And if so, did your dog inspire the character Streaker from 100 miles an hour dog? The short answer is yes and no. Um, and the long answer is no and yes. Well, actually, what happened was I did have a dog of my own. My dog was called Lucy, and I had her from a little puppy. She was a mongrel, uh, a bit of everything, you know, and I trained her. I could say to her, sit, and she would sit. I could say, stay, and she'd say, stay, and she'd stay. And I could call her, and I'd say, Lucy, and she'd come straight to me. And I could say to her, go make me a cup of tea. And she'd look very confused. Uh, so that was Lucy. And I was teaching at the time, and a friend of mine, uh, Jane, she had two dogs called Molly and Mabel. One day she rang me up and she said she had a big problem at home. She was going to have to go out all day to try and sort things out. Uh, her dogs would be stuck at home. Could I take Molly and Mabel for a walk when I took Lucy for a walk? Because she knew I had a dog. And I said, yeah, no problem. So at lunchtime, I went over to Jane's house and I collected uh, Molly and Mabel. I took them to the nearest field. I let them off their leads and Molly went shoomph at high speed in that way. And Mabel went shoomph at high speed in the opposite direction. And that was the last I saw them. Because after they'd gone shoomph and shoomph, I discovered that they didn't know what their names were. I called them, Molly, Mabel. You know, they just carried on. Oh. What's he saying? What did he say? What's he talking about? Anyway, um, eventually, after about half an hour, they, they did come back to me. But I'd been watching uh, Mabel, uh, there's Molly in particular, and Molly was, was just absolutely um, amazingly fast. You know, she just went zooming this way, zooming that way, 100 miles an hour. But she didn't know her name. She didn't know any command. She was absolutely hopeless but very lovable. And that was where the idea for Streaker came from. She came from Molly in particular. There's a little bit of noise going on. Oh, yeah. Yep. Are we okay? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. absolutely. Okay. Sorry, Suzanne, if you're there, I'll hand over to you. Hello, I think oh. I'm back. Am I back? Can you all hear me? I can hear you. Excellent. Um, so the next question is, what will your next book be? Well, actually, Alfred. funnily enough, hello, Alfred. Hi. Very 
Thank you for your question. Uh, funnily enough, I started my next book yesterday, although I started thinking about it uh, uh, before Christmas, but I've only just been able to get around to, to writing it. And it's a third book of stories, because I've been asked to write a, a third book about Armadillo and Hare, and it is called Armadillo and Hare and the Flamingo Affair. And um, what can I tell you about it? Well, it's obviously got a flamingo in it. So there will be several stories with a, not just armadillo and hare, but also flamingo and jaguar and mouse and tortoise and wombat and uh, and so on. Okay, so that that's going to that's going to be the next book. Hopefully, I shall have it finished by the summer. Thank you for your question. Fantastic. Thank you for that answer. Um, the next question is, where do you get your ideas for your stories from? And that's from Luca. Well, Lucas, we've, we've been talking about that already, haven't we? we and I told you about um, the tuba with the flames coming out of it. I showed you the photograph and, and uh, we've just been talking about the 100 mile an hour dog and, and so on. Um, but there is one more, one more, and, and the indoor pirates I told you about too. But here's another little story for you, which is absolutely true. <clears throat> a few years ago, I walked into a friend's glass door. Obviously, I didn't mean to, but that's what happened. I walked into the door, I split my head open. It hurt. It almost knocked me out, in fact. It hurt. When I took my hand away from my head, I looked at it and I thought, oh dear, blood. And my friend looked at my forehead and he said, <clears throat> that's a bad cut. That needs some stitches. We better get you to hospital. We went off to the hospital. When we got there, I wasn't looking forward to it. I've had stitches before. Anyway, the nurse didn't stitch it. She put super glue on it. Yeah, super glue. Now, you can't do this at home just because you cut yourself. You can't get the super glue out. It has to be special medical super glue. But I didn't realize how to put used to the glue. So I was talking to the nurse about it. She told me that the previous week a boy had been brought into the hospital with, uh, with a, he'd done the same thing as me, walked into a glass of spit his forehead. And while she was putting the super glue on, she managed to get all her fingers stuck to the boy's forehead. Okay? So now the nurse was stuck to her patient. So I, so I said to her, well, that must have been rather awkward for you. What did you do? What did you do? What did you do? And she said, oh, it was all right. I was wearing a rubber glove, so I was able to take my hand away. What's left behind? The rubber glove still stuck to the boy's forehead. So now the boy's wandering around the hospital with the rubber glove stuck to his forehead. Going, blah, 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 blah. I thought that was so funny. It was so funny. And I quickly got out my notebook and I wrote it all down. And yeah, sure. after, a few months later, I was writing a story where I was able to use this idea of the, the boy with the rubber glove stuck to the forehead. So you never know where those ideas are going to come from. They're, they're all around us. It's just a question of noticing them. I think, I think we've got time for one more question, Suzanne and uh, Jeremy. Last question. One more question. We've got an as aspiring writer here uh, called okay. Lehan in South Africa. Um, she's written and illustrated my first book, age seven, and haven't stopped writing since. What would your advice be for an aspiring writer like myself to make my dream a reality? What a wonderful question to finish with. Okay, well, keep going, basically. Keep going. Keep writing and keep reading. Read as many books as you can. It, and when you find a book that you really enjoy then ask yourself, why do I enjoy that? What is it about the writing in that story that I like? Is it because it's funny? Is it because it's exciting? If it's because it's, you know, exciting or funny, how, is, how has the writer made it funny? How does the writing actually make it funny or exciting or, or whatever? And you can learn, in other words, you can learn from the way other writers write stories. This is what happened with Armadillo and Hare. I tried writing those stories. They weren't coming out properly. I was having a lot of difficulty with it. I just wanted to write the stories. But sometimes you have an idea in your head, but every time you try to put it down on paper, it comes out as rubbish. And I'm sure uh, many of you writers out there have come across that problem. You know, trying to make that story 
as good on paper as the one that's going on in your head. So um, in, in, with Armadillo and uh, Hare, eventually I found myself reading a book of stories one day, a children's book, and I was reading it. And as I read it, I thought, I like the way this story is written. I like the way the writer has managed to make it like this. That's the way I want to, I need to write for my new set of stories about Armadillo and Hare. Okay, so that's, the, that's something very important you can do. And the important thing is just to keep writing and writing and writing. And I am quite sure that soon you'll be writing really good stories. Jacqueline Wilson, I remember Jackie telling me that she tried to first get a story published when she was about 14. Um, I don't think it did get published, but that was when she first started trying. So, you know, you can, you can start trying to get stories published whenever you like. But I'm so pleased to hear that you love writing stories so much, and I, I wish you all the best with your writing. Keep, keep at it. That's amazing. All the best. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Um, so I think that's about all we've got time for. So let's have a big old virtual round of applause for Jeremy Strong. Um, um, and th thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. Um, the events this week are all free, um, but if you can, it would be wonderful if you could make a thank you so of, much. Thank you. Thank bit of a donation. Sorry, I'm having a bit of a time lag here. Um, if you could make a donation so we can keep bringing you fantastic literary content that you love. Um, if you donate, on you're the website, lovely to be able to speak to you. If you donate on the website here, you can pay in dollars, or if you go to the Barnes website, you'll pay in pounds. Um, we've got some fantastic content coming up for the rest of the week. So do take a look at our website and register for some events. Once again, thank you for tuning in. He has been Jeremy Strong. I think he's that direction. I have been Suzanne Curley, and this has been the Barnes Children's Literature Festival at oh. home. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Goodbye.